Just moments ago, for instance, Nova Scotia declared a state of emergency, which means now all provinces in this country have declared some state of emergency or other. It has also restricted gatherings of more than five people. That is one of the most dramatic steps taken by a province so far. They are also now telling anyone coming into Nova Scotia that they need to self-isolate for 14 days, even if they've been inside this country, one of just a number of Atlantic provinces making that move. And this hour, we are expecting to hear more about the federal response. The Prime Minister will give us some details on Ottawa's plan to help stabilize the Canadian economy. Uh, the House of Commons expected to return here and vote on some of the measures announced last week on Tuesday. But first, let me start in Nova Scotia, where that most recent news happened. Last hour, Premier Stephen McNeil had some sharp words for those who are not self-isolating or social distancing. Take a listen. Today, I need to focus on those who are not following public health advice. Over the weekend, I saw and heard of far too many incidents of people gathering, blatantly disregarding the social and physical distance rules of staying six feet or two meters apart. Hundreds gathering on our beaches and in our parks, large groups of people congregating, young people playing street hockey, cars parked everywhere people disregarding law enforcement. We are dealing with a deadly virus, and this behavior is unacceptable. And so today, effective immediately, I am declaring a provincial state of emergency. Minister Porter is here to explain what that means, and Minister Fury is here to explain how we will enforce it. We are also reducing the size of gatherings effective immediately. People cannot gather in groups of more than five. You can still go outside, but you walk to exercise, not to socialize. Stay in your neighborhood, walk around the block or down the street. Our provincial parks are closed. If you go there, you are trespassing and your vehicles will be towed. You can get groceries, you can go to the pharmacy, but do not do it in packs. Identify a single family member who can do those errands. And if you are an individual helping neighbors, please continue to do so. All right, that was Stephen McNeil, the Premier of Nova Scotia, where there they've taken some extraordinary measures because, as the Premier just said, people are simply not listening enough to advice from public health officials. In fact, if you were on Twitter at all last night, we saw a number of examples of that trending on Twitter, uh, large groups of people gathering at English Bay in Vancouver. So uh, this is one province trying to take some extreme measures to crack down and have police enforce self-isolation and social distancing. It will not be the only one. We We've certainly seen that in Quebec as well. Let me give you an update on where we stand in terms of cases right now in this country. More than 1,300 cases of COVID-19 have been uh, confirmed. We are still at 19 deaths. The most recent series of deaths, I believe it was four, happened in Quebec at a long-term care center, which is one of the points of vulnerability that Canada's public health officer is so worried about right now. We are expecting to hear from the Prime Minister outside of his home, Rideau Cottage there, a, a door we've all become familiar with, to hear more about a few things, but most particularly um, the legislative action that needs to happen this week to get people additional um, financial aid. So let me bring in my colleague, the CBC's David Cochran. David, thanks for joining us here on a Sunday. Um, so they are going to come back on Tuesday at noon, it seems. Yeah, I think we're, we're gonna, it's going to be an extraordinary session of Parliament, the likes of which we have never seen uh, in this country. Only about 30 MPs is our understanding, proportional to the, the setup of the House, and all MPs who live within driving distance. So the normal representation of the country will not be present in the House of Commons. The, the partisan representation will. Uh, in what will be a day of, we suspect, historic cooperation to deal with an unprecedented situation. So we've gotten the official word of that from the House of Commons. We're expecting to hear something from that about that from the Prime Minister today, as well as an update on repatriation efforts. Yesterday, I was watching you at home, uh, from home at yester yesterday, talking about the first flight coming from Morocco, efforts to get into places like Spain and Peru. Obviously, this is moving extremely fast, and it is a very difficult and fluid situation. We're expecting something from Justin Trudeau on that. And Rosie, I think we're going to have to hear something from the Prime Minister 
on all of this blatant ignorance of the social distancing re recommendations that is happening across the country. They have been warning <laughs> that they don't want to use the Emergency Act unless they absolutely have to, counting more on the provinces and the municipalities to get ahead of it. And we've seen this sort of hopscotching of more restrictive measures as uh -huh. each province sort of ramps up their response to things, with Nova Scotia banning gatherings in groups of, of five and under, Quebec banning essentially all public gatherings in response to <coughs> all of this. Um, most Canadians seem to be listening, but there are enough Canadians not listening. It's of a significant public health concern for politicians at all level, including the Prime Minister. And we heard Patty Hyde say yesterday, listen to this or severe restrictions are going to be coming. Mm -hmm. I, I would bet everything I have in the bank right now that the Prime Minister will be asked about that today. Yeah, I, I, she was. Uh, she, she made an extraordinary appeal to people, saying you either do this to protect yourself and the health of others, or your civil liberties uh, will be suspended, essentially, because police will have to enforce this writ large across the country. Uh, and you're right, we are seeing an escalation of those measures from police, uh, from provinces rather. But it, it, but it also comes at a time when we see when it being ignored in places like France, for instance, it was certainly ignored in Italy, and it results in more cases and it results in more deaths. So, um, you know, I, even anecdotally, I've heard of, of gatherings of friends and, and people, neighbors and things, and, and this could not be more serious, this appeal from, from the government and from public health officials. Yeah, I heard a New York Times reporter speaking about this in the context of the American situation, saying that America was sort of founded on the principles of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And he made the point, you can't have liberty or happiness if you're not alive. So, you know, you might want to start prioritizing yeah. which of these things matter to you. And this is really it, like that every single one of us is essentially an Uber for COVID-19. The virus can't move without us moving around. And I was even in a grocery store yesterday buying supplies for my family, and a guy would not stay six feet away from me. When I kept asking him to do it, he kept saying, you're overreacting. I'm on the bus. This isn't a problem. I'm like, oh, my God, man, back right. up. Right. So right. It, the message is not getting through for whatever reason. Okay, David, thank you for that. I'm just, uh, I'm going to go quickly to Dr. Lin, who is joining us now, because the Prime Minister is expected to uh, come up from his house at around 11.15. Uh, CBC News medical contributor, Dr. Lin. Dr. Lin, good to see you. Um, good to see what, you, what, do you what do you make of this, that, that some provinces are now having to crack down in a much more aggressive way, not only over quarantines, self-isolation, but in Nova Scotia, even over social distancing? Right. So in other words, they're saying that it hasn't worked. So the nice way of telling people stay away from each other because the virus needs to jump from one person to the next. And if you stay six feet away from other people, then this virus cannot get to you. So that simple message wasn't getting through. So people were still gathering. And if we allow them to do that, you're going to see the virus start to spread within the community. And so once it goes into the community, then tracing is difficult and everybody needs testing and it will overwhelm the healthcare system. So the idea is that if they bring in these very strong measures and then put in a threat in other words they don't really want to arrest everybody yeah. what they want to do is just say this is serious please just pay attention so that we don't end up like Italy or France or okay. China where they had to send drones around you know they had actually drones watching the streets and things mm -hmm. like that uh, and so the hope is that if we do this early uh, then they are not going to repeat some of the other provinces where we're seeing the numbers increasing uh, every single day what would you say to Canadians then who are still, uh, you know, I made that example of, of English Bay yesterday in, in British Columbia, people who are still having playdates with large groups of children. What would you say to Canadians that are still doing that? What, what's your best advice to them? I think the problem is that we told, told everybody it's sick people, right? So people are expecting somebody coughing or sneezing. Uh, and so they're saying there was nobody coughing and sneezing. We're hearing these stories of people getting sick. They went to a little house party, 10 people, nobody was sick, nobody was coughing, and they got the virus. So now we realize that if you're close contact, the virus, when people breathe out, there may be some viruses there. It doesn't go very far, but if I'm sitting right next to you or I'm really close to you, then I may breathe that in. So that's one of the things that we're worried about is that these people don't look sick, and yet you're still able to pick it up. So the only way that you could really be sure is to stay that six feet apart. So when they're saying small gatherings, I don't want five people next to each other. I want five yeah. people with six feet apart if they're going right. to gather in that way. Yeah. You're probably not having a dinner party when you're that far apart either. So, yeah, exactly. or, or a really big table. <laughs> That's <laughs> right. Okay, Dr. Lin, I'll, I'll leave it there for now, but be back to you later. Thank you again for all that uh, smart medical advice. We do appreciate it.
Uh, one of the things, of course, that we're expecting the Prime Minister to talk about is the legislation that will be uh, passed in an extraordinary way and extraordinarily quickly this week to allow workers and businesses to tap into some much-needed financial aid, because many workers have been hit hard, of course, across the country. I've heard from many of you on Twitter wondering what to do and when this additional help will be available. One of those industries, and there are so many, is construction workers. Some are still able to work, but many others have been laid off as the country becomes increasingly locked down. Matthew Day is a construction worker here in Ottawa. He was recently laid off as a result of the COVID-19 outbreak. Hi, Matthew. Good to see you. I, I may cut you off in case the Prime Minister emerges, but um, thanks for being here. How, how are you doing? Uh, thanks very much for having me. We're doing okay so far. Uh, it's just started. Uh, I was laid off uh, last week, so applied for EI. Uh, that will take in effect uh, starting Monday, so tomorrow. Okay, so w when we heard of this huge uh, overload of the system, the Prime Minister said last week there were half a million people who had applied. You were paying into it already, so you were obviously, you know, part of the system. H how difficult was it for you? Uh, actually, applying wasn't overly difficult. Uh, I knew when my end date was going to be. My employer had uh, already told us at the beginning of the week that we were going to shut down by the end of the week. It was uh, becoming too dangerous for the workers to go onto the sites. So uh, a lot of us were able to apply preemptively. We were able to get on the site. Uh, calling was uh, useless. We couldn't get through to anybody. Uh, however, a lot of the people that work with me are private contractors and they can't apply mm -hmm. at all mm -hmm. until April uh, or uh, at least a week into April. And then again, the system's gonna be overloaded for the second time. So just so I understand uh, correctly why you got laid off, was it because people have to work in too close quarters or because the contract was drying up? Uh, too close quarters. So okay. there are uh, five major developers in the Ottawa area. Uh, three out of five had completely shut down their construction sites. We work in an urban development zone, uh, building houses, new builds, mm -hmm. and uh, three out of five had sh completely shut down as a result of not being able to control the spread, not being able to control uh, social distancing between the tradespeople within those houses. And as a result, we didn't have the demand for our trade to go okay. into those uh, construction zones, and therefore we had to shut it down. So uh, if, if our calculations are right, you'll get about 1800 bucks a month, so that's 450 a week, and that'll be for 14 weeks. I imagine the government will extend that if needed. How, how will, I think I hear some little people uh, in the background, so will that cover all the expenses that, that you have? Uh, it won't, it actually won't even cover rent. Um, ah. The average rent in Ottawa for a two bedroom uh, apartment or condo is $1,800, um, that's roughly about the max that people are going to get while on this uh, employment insurance. So it's not going to cover it. Um, the child benefit increase that's coming into effect won't come into effect until May. Um, for myself, that uh, happens in the middle of the month, so that's eight weeks away. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a very large concern. We've spoken to banks, we've spoken to landlords. Um, the deferrals that uh, Trudeau has spoken about simply aren't coming into play. Um, people who because, have mortgages because, because you rent is that why or because you have a mortgage uh, I, I personally rent um, we were in close contact with our landlords who have been fantastic about it they were told uh, flat out that they didn't um, ha qualify because they hadn't had the mortgage long enough and I don't know how many people that applies to across Canada and for their own mortgage they were told that they didn't uh, qualify because they didn't have um, loss of income insurance it wasn't a part of their mortgage plan already. As a result, they didn't qualify. So uh, it seems that the banks do have the ability to defer mortgages. Mm -hmm. However, uh, they are not going outside of the regular streams in order to do so. If you don't already qualify before this pandemic, uh, you're not qualifying as a result of it. Okay, so I, I got about a minute before the Prime Minister uh, comes out of his house here to talk to us. Matthew, how, how stressed are you, or are you stressed? Like, are, how worried are you about things? Uh, my biggest worry is that um, my necessity will be to go back to work before it's safe to go back to work. My wife and children will travel to family um, outside of Ottawa where they can stay in quarantine for 14 days. My wife has um, a compromised immune system, but I'll be forced to go back to work before it's uh, safe to go back to work. And that's why we're seeing um, this social spread is because we aren't, most people are not in a position to simply stop working, stay at home, and have that be the end of it. Um, we have to get out there, we have to pay bills, 
And uh, your other option is uh, huge debt. And, and, and how do you get out of that once this ends? And, and, the, and the answer is, I don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. We're looking at long-term um, financial debt for a lot of Canadians. And what does that do for us and small businesses around us when we come out of this um, pandemic? Will we have any disposable income to speak of? I won't. As a result, myself and many other people will end up back at work long before we should be together. We should, we should be there. Okay, Matthew, I, I know that this is a situation that is playing out uh, all too often right now across the country. You're, you're one example. I appreciate you sharing our story, and, and I, hope, uh, I hope things improve. They, they, they surely will for you and your family. Thank you very much. I appreciate right. you taking the Take time. Care. All right, stay healthy. Thank you. And there is Justin Trudeau just coming out of his home now, Rideau Cottage, where he is going to address Canadians for the seventh time uh, to talk about measures his government is taking. Let's listen in. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being with us again today. It has now been several weeks that public health officials have been asking Canadians to help them to slow the spread of COVID-19. We have to work from home now, cancel evenings with friends, limit our travel, and avoid gatherings. I know that it isn't always easy to do that, so I want to begin by saying thank you to all of those following the instructions. In order to slow the spread of the virus, we must all do our part. We must all make sacrifices in order to protect not only our own health, but those of others, that of others. Adjustments that people are making this week are reassuring, but we must continue. thank everyone who's working overtime to keep us safe and keep the country moving. Hospital staff, border agents, store clerks, cashiers, postal workers, delivery folks, pharmacists, cleaning staff, first responders, truck drivers, train conductors, and so many others. They've been working every day so we can work from home and practice social distancing. Thank you for being there for us. Know that all Canadians are grateful for your service. I know that many of you are worried about what might happen next. You're wondering how long this is going to last. You're wondering about your job and your savings. You're worried about your kids not being in school. And we get it. These are uncertain times and families across the country are concerned. That's why this week we took important steps to support Canadians, protect jobs and limit the spread of the virus. We unveiled an $82 billion plan to help people and businesses who've fallen on hard times because of COVID-19. As part of this plan, we want to boost the Canada Child Benefit, introduce new benefits to help people who don't qualify for employment insurance, and supplement the GST credit, amongst many other things. Our government also announced new funding for research and a new strategy to mobilize industry to fight COVID-19. After conversations with our colleagues on the other side of the aisle, I can now confirm that the House of Commons will be recalled on Tuesday at noon so we can pass emergency legislation that will put our plan into motion. On that note, I want to thank the House leaders for their cooperation and the members of the opposition for their efforts as we work together to slow the spread of this virus. I know that together, we can protect Canadians, save jobs, and set the groundwork for our economy to rebound after this crisis. In addition to our economic strategy, we also announced new restrictions on travel. We temporarily closed our borders to international travelers. We also reached an agreement with the United States to prohibit non-essential travel between our two countries. And we will continue to encourage Canadians who are abroad to come back home. But I know that many people are still having trouble finding a flight to return 
return to Canada. Yesterday, I announced that our government is working with the Canadian Airlines to facilitate their return to Canada. A first Air Canada flight from Morocco arrived last evening and other flights will be added. For its part, WestJet has announced that uh, from Monday to Wednesday, more than 30 flights are planned to help Canadians return home. Air Transat is also working with uh, Global Affairs to get special permission to fly in airspaces that are now closed. It intends to bring thousands of people back home in the coming days. And when there are still places on Sunwing, that company is offering flights home for free for those who need them. More details on what we've announced so far on the government website at Canada.ca. And since there's more support coming this week, that's where you'll find all the information you need and the help you deserve. We are facing an unprecedented situation, and I know that many people are worried. When you call Service Canada and cannot speak to an agent, or when you're abroad and you cannot find a flight, I know that uh, creates even more anxiety. I can assure you that uh, the entire civil service is working around the clock to resolve these problems and provide you with the assistance that you deserve. From the start, we have said that we would be there for you. We promised that our government would do everything in its power to support you. We have come through a number of important steps in recent weeks, but you must know that the work is continuing. We will not abandon you. You can rely on us. I want to thank you all for helping us slow the spread of COVID-19. To those of you who usually spend your Sundays in a place of worship, thank you for staying home today. I know it's not easy, but it is deeply appreciated. And to all the kids out there, all of a sudden you've heard you can't go on play dates or have sleepovers. Your playgrounds and schools have closed and your March break was certainly different than what you'd hoped for. I get it from my kids as well. They're watching, watching a whole lot more movies, uh, but they miss their friends. Uh, and at the same time, they're worried about what's going on out there in the world and what their future may hold. I know this is a big change, but we have to do this not just for ourselves, but for our grandparents, our nurses, our doctors, and everyone working at our hospitals. And you kids are helping a lot. The doctors and scientists have been clear that social distancing, which means staying at least two meters apart and staying home as much as possible, is the best way to help each other. And you're having to wash your hands a lot. So, a special thanks to all you kids. Thank you for helping your parents work from home, for sacrificing your usual day, for doing math class around the kitchen table, and for trusting in science. We're going to have more to say to you soon, so stay tuned. In the meantime, let's make sure we all do our part. Let's fight this together. Merci beaucoup tout le monde. I'm now ready to take your questions. Mr. Trudeau, uh, Radio-Canada. Now we see on the social media uh, a lot of photos of parks with tons of people, people who don't seem to be worried about social distancing. So what is your message to those people? And at what point would your government feel it had to uh, crack down and bring in coercive measures? Well, obviously, our message to everyone is that you have to stay home. Please practice social distancing. That is absolutely essential in order to stop the spread of this virus and in order to protect our fellow citizens and especially those working in the healthcare system. We each have an opportunity to flatten the curve of this virus and protect our communities, and we absolutely must do that. We are taking measures as a country, the provinces as well. We are working with them and coordinating our efforts uh, with respect to the next uh, steps that may be needed, but for the time being, we continue to ask everyone and encourage everyone to stay home and to help our country to come through this crisis.
I recognize that millions of Canadians are practicing social distancing, are uh, choosing to stay home, are looking for ways to keep uh, two meters apart from each other, and taking this very seriously. That's great because this is a situation in which individual Canadians behaving responsibly will help themselves, help their neighbours, and mostly protect our healthcare workers. This is something we need to do together. We are, of course, continuing to work very closely with uh, uh, with uh, all provinces, uh, with different orders of government, uh, to make sure that people are uh, understanding what they need to do and doing it. Uh, we will continue to look at possible next steps that may become necessary, but for now we are uh, telling people, stay home, engage in social distancing, protect yourselves, protect our system, and let's get through this strongly as a country. Le beau temps commence à peine. It's uh, starting to be nice outside and people are uh, more tempted to go outside. Don't you think it would be relevant for uh, Ottawa to invoke the Emergency Measures Act to prevent this kind of thing? Well, I think that people are obviously happy to see spring coming and people can go outside, but they must keep the proper distance from each other. It's important to avoid any gatherings. I think that's extremely important, and we have to conti continue to keep our distance. As I said, we are looking at all the tools that may be needed to keep Canadians safe. We are working with the provinces. We see what the provinces are doing at this time, and we're coordinating those efforts. And, of course, if other ne measures are necessary, we will take them people to stay home and to social distance is not enough. There is mounting evidence of social media, pictures of people packing onto beaches in Vancouver, for example. Why not invoke something stricter like the Emergencies Act? Uh, why not, you know, restrict people's civil, civil liberties to protect their health? There are many things that are being done and can be done at the local level, at the municipal level, uh, and at the provincial level. Uh, the Federal Emergencies Act uh, is a significant step that uh, can and should be taken when we've exhausted all other steps at other orders of government and the legislation and regulations available to the federal government do not respond uh, or are insufficient to respond to the situation at hand. We continue to work very closely. Uh, with provinces, uh, with other jurisdictions, to make sure that they are able to do the things that need to be done. And we will continue to look at, uh, if it's necessary, uh, to move forward with the Emergencies Act. Your party put, took down a public appeal that used the COVID crisis to fundraise for the Liberal Party. Why was that taken down, and what did you do about it? Uh, I can't speak for, uh, for, for that decision. I'm, I, obviously, this is a situation in which Canadians need to pull together. Uh, we need to be there to support each other. Uh, we need to make sure we're using all different methods to connect and pass important messages to Canadians on how to stay safe and how to make sure that we are, uh, that we are properly uh, protecting ourselves, our communities, and protecting healthcare workers. Uh, I know that everyone needs to use whatever uh, methods of communications they have, uh, but uh, it's not a situation for fundraising. Hi, it's Annie Bergeron Oliver with CTV National News. Companies across Canada have said that they're willing and able to retool their production lines and to ramp up production, but they say that they need assurances from the federal government. Will your government guarantee that it will buy supplies like masks and ventilators if companies start producing them immediately? That is very much part of our industrial strategy that we just announced to get uh, companies across the country to manufacture essential equipment, whether it's ventilators or masks or gowns. Uh, we've had already a tremendous positive response uh, from companies. It uh, both creates things that we need in Canada and that uh, will be necessary elsewhere around the world, uh, as well as keeping Canadians uh, at work in factories uh, contributing to uh, our economic activity. These are things that we're going to continue to do and uh, we can assure companies that produce these things that uh, we need them and we will use them. So is that a yes that companies that are producing them immediately will have their purchases, their products purchased? And two, are you considering any incentives to keep people home? 
Uh, we are looking at ways of ensuring that people uh, can stay home by uh, sending uh, EI supports to people who don't normally qualify for them, income replacements that'll make sure that people don't uh, face a choice between having to uh, go out there and work in order to feed their family uh, and possibly put, uh, put their neighbours and themselves at risk. Uh, we want to be able to be able to choose home. So Brian Mullen at the Global News. Um, I have a question about economic aid for Canadians. Denmark has a very aggressive plan, paying about 75% of people's salaries to avoid mass layoffs and let them keep their jobs and encourage them to stay home, basically freezing their economy in the hopes it'll eventually thaw out with less damage in the long run. Did your government consider this option and rule it out? Uh, we have not ruled out anything. As I said, we uh, put forward a significant package of $27 billion directly into the economy to support workers, to support small businesses, but that was only the initial phase of what is necessary. We are continuing to talk about next steps, looking at best practices from around the world, looking what other countries and jurisdictions are doing to ensure that our economy remains solid if at a standstill so that it can pick up again uh, once this crisis is through. And a question about personal protective equipment, not just for frontline hospital staff, but for other essential workers. Once the virus ramps up, people will burn through it fast. Do we have what we need now? Are you bringing in shipments right now from other countries, including China? Uh, we are confident in our capacity to ramp up to provide protective equipment for uh, frontline hospital staff and others who need it uh, so importantly. Uh, this is something that Canada has been uh, working towards for a while now. We will uh, ensure uh, that the equipment is available for those who need it right across the country. Uh, good morning, Prime Minister Trudeau. Uh, Sean Silikoff at the Globe and Mail. I hope your family's uh, doing well, as well as can be in the circumstances like every other uh, person in Canada. Uh, just picking up on my colleague's question about freezing the economy, this seems to be a fairly significant move by a number of countries. Um, uh, can you share with us your views uh, and your government's views about taking this approach? I've talked this morning to several business leaders, uh, including Goldie Hyder, um, uh, and uh, they're all concerned that uh, this economy will go into a tailspin, and they think it would be better to push money um, from the government through them to their employees rather than seeing another week of 500,000 or a million Canadians applying to EI and overwhelming your government's resources to, practice, uh, to, to process those applications, and then again to fill in more paperwork to uh, apply for their jobs back. Can you tell us a little bit more, maybe go into more detail about your thinking about this approach? Because it seems to be uh, the thought leadership that's, uh, that everyone is looking at in the last couple of days. We've been listening and speaking with uh, business leaders in this country, uh, top employers, small business groups, representatives right across the country to hear their ideas on how to move forward. We've been listening to opposition leaders who are making different suggestions as well. I can tell you that nothing is off the table, but I can also tell you that there is no one measure that is going to be sufficient to get us through this situation. We are going to need to bring in many different measures that have different impacts on employers, on employees, on workers, on families, on vulnerable Canadians, on uh, Canadians of all sorts of different uh, challenges and, and, and situations in order to be able to hold strong through this time of uh, economic uh, stoppage uh, to have, of so much activity so that we can then as we are through this, pick up uh, without uh, having lost too much or anything and uh, without too much delay. Uh, yes, uh, it is obvious that uh, companies that are able to keep people on the payroll longer uh, will find it easier and not have to rehire later. And that is certainly something that we are looking at. It's something we've taken steps already towards with the payroll uh, credit. Uh, but there is more to do, and these are the things that we're absolutely looking at. But like I said, there is no one silver bullet. It is going to be many, many different measures brought together in the most efficient way uh, that will help us do this. And uh, what guidance can you provide Canadians and uh, employers about how long the current maximum containment phase will last before we can shift gears to a more targeted containment where most people can return to work? Will it be 
weeks, months, or several quarters? Uh, that is a question for scientists. Obviously, we are taking the best advice from uh, top researchers around the world. We're looking at uh, the track of the spread of the disease uh, in China, in places like South Korea, uh, in places like Taiwan and Singapore, uh, looking at uh, the challenges uh, facing Europe, and particularly Italy right now, and uh, trying to make sure that we are taking the best possible decisions here in Canada. Uh, we know that uh, self-isolation and social distancing is going to be extremely important in the coming weeks. We're going to have to maintain it. We also know that uh, testing on a much larger scale is going to be very important, which is why we're testing, ramping up the amount of tests done by tens of thousands every single day. We will continue uh, to look to do exactly what we need to do in the time it takes. I wish, uh, I wish anyone could give a date at which point this will all be behind us, uh, but that really depends not just on what we do today, but what we keep doing tomorrow and into next week and into next month. And that's why we all need to be working together to get through this, as I know Canadians will. Thank you. We'll now go to the phone for a few questions. If uh, you'll have one question in a quick follow-up. Moderator. Thank you. Merci. The next question is from Raymond Fillon. The next question is from Raymond Fillon. Your line is open. Votre ligne est ouverte. Tu es peut-être sur mute, Ray. Sorry, sorry. Uh, good morning, Prime Minister. Now, following up on my colleague's question, doctors and business people are asking you for more strict and coercive measures to make sure that people stay home. Can you please tell us why you don't think the time has come to order people to stay home? Well, we recognize that uh, at the municipal and provincial levels, they are already taking measures to e restrict uh, movement even more, and that's what we're recommending. But in order for the federal government to do that, we would have to be at a stage where we have really gone be far, far beyond what can be done at the provincial level, and there is a need for uh, emergency measures at the federal level to provide those powers. We are not at that stage yet, but we are looking very carefully at the situation to see uh, if that will be needed. Merci. The next question is from La prochaine question is de Guillaume Saint Pierre du Roman de Montréal. Your line is open. Votre ligne est ouverte. Good morning, Mr. Trudeau. You talked about. Uh, uh, flights uh, to help people in Spain and other countries, when will people, when will flights be available to bring those Canadians home? I can tell you that Global Affairs is working directly with the governments in Peru and Spain and right around the world to ensure that we have access to airports so that uh, flights can take off when the airspace is closed. We need permission in order to do that. That. And we are hopeful that we can make announcements on that very, very soon. I understand there are many Canadians who are waiting to see when those planes are going to arrive, and we're going to be we're working very, very hard to bring these people home as soon as possible. But uh, I'm asking people to be patient. So is it a question of days or a week? It's a question of days. And you also said yesterday that you find it regrettable that some people will not be able to come home. So what are you saying to people who are stranded in Peru uh, and who are ill and cannot uh, board a flight uh, and who are now in difficult conditions in remote places? What do you say to the families of those people who are stranded? Well, as I said a few days ago, and as I reminded people yesterday, there are three million people at all times that are outside the country. Now, obviously, uh, uh, everyone will not be able to or want to necessarily come back home. Now, if some people have to remain where they are, we're, they will need to self-isolate, and we can provide assistance in the form of money through global affairs, but we're asking you to register on the website 
by uh, travel.gc.ca. We'll do everything we can to keep you safe. But unfortunately, we're dealing with a global uh, crisis that is unprecedented, and we don't necessarily have all the tools we need to help everyone as we would like to. But we will definitely try to help everyone we can, and that's what Global Affairs is working on right now with the Canadian airlines and other countries to try and bring home as many Canadians as possible. Merci. Last question, moderator. Thank you. Merci. La dernière question est de. The last question is from David Youngbread from Reuters, Ottawa. What thing you to ask? Your line is open. David, you might be on mute as well. Good grief. And there I was sending a tweet mocking another colleague for having done uh, There you go. It's. it's yeah. Anyway. <laughs> Okay, you, you're live now, David, so you can ask your question. Thank you, Kelly. Um, you, you talked about the next weeks of social isolation, but Paddy Haidu, your health minister, made clear yesterday that we're talking about months, not weeks. Now, this is surely the need to keep the economy from freezing over months rather than weeks surely means, as my other colleagues have asked you, that you're going to have to boost your, 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 your reaction. The, the fiscal stimulus plan is going to have to be much bigger than the $27 billion you've announced. Yes, as we've said, uh, what we announced this past week, the $27 billion uh, directly into the economy, uh, the $55 billion in uh, uh, deferred taxes, uh, these are only a very first step. Uh, we're looking now at what those next steps are to ensure that our economy uh, is able to pick up against once we're through this, uh, whether it takes weeks or months. It is likely to take months uh, before we're fully through this. That's why supporting directly to Canadians, support directly to small businesses, to large businesses, to industry, uh, to various sectors that will be much harder hit. These are things we are busy looking at in order so that once we move through this, we are able uh, to get back to where we were before as quickly as possible. Great, thank you. Uh, Effectivement, nous reconnaissons que ce yes, que nous avons we recognize that what we did last week, the $27 billion in direct support, the $55 billion in deferral of taxes, that that will be a first step towards helping people. But of course, there are other things we will have to do, whether it is directly for small business and large industries or for workers and families. We know that uh, the idea will be to come through this situation and uh, uh, during this period of extreme slowdown in the economy so that we can ramp up our economic activity as soon as possible afterwards. This is a difficult situation and it will require multiple solutions and this is work we'll all do together but we will do it and we will come through this together as Canadians. Thank you and have a great Sunday. Okay. And that is the Prime Minister of Canada addressing Canadians for the seventh day in a row here about his government's measures to try to contain the COVID-19 pandemic and also to try and make sure that the economy uh, doesn't collapse, essentially, uh, over the next weeks and months. Uh, the big news, of course, uh, from the Prime Minister today is that Parliament will indeed be reconvening on Tuesday to approve some emergency measures. Uh, it's an extraordinary move and uh, it will happen at an extraordinary pace. For more on that and reaction to uh, what the government's been doing over the past week. We've invited the leader of the official opposition and the Conservative Party of Canada, Andrew Scheer, onto the program. Good to see you, Mr. Scheer. Appreciate you being here. Thanks for having me on. Uh, let, let's start with Parliament being recalled on Tuesday. Um, any, are there any concerns from your party around how quickly this has to happen and the measures that are being proposed by the government? Mm -hmm. Well, we support the notion of getting assistance out to Canadians as quickly as possible. Uh, we've all heard stories of uh, people who are going through uh, extreme hardship, uh, very worried about how they're going to make their mortgage payment, uh, their rent, pay their utilities. Uh, so we are supportive of the government coming, of, of, of the House coming back very quickly and passing these measures quickly. Uh, we do believe that there needs to be more done. Uh, we have been calling on the government uh, to do more for workers who are affected by uh, retail stores and restaurants 
restaurants being ordered to close, uh, as well as for those small businesses themselves. So we've asked for the government to uh, refund the GST that they've collected uh, from uh, from the elite for the past six months at least, uh, as well as drastically increasing the uh, wage sub subsidy to keep more people uh, employed during this difficult time. We, we have seen, and the Prime Minister was asked about this in other countries, uh, a real shoring up of, of income, sort of a universal basic income or even further than that in some countries. Would that be something that you would support? Do you think it's something the government needs to consider? Certainly the Prime Minister suggested it's possible going forward, but it's not something they're doing yet. Mm -hmm. Well, what we want to make sure is that the, the assistance is done in a targeted and timely manner. You know, uh, this is going to be a very difficult period for people for, for, for the next few weeks at least and, and, and well beyond in terms of the economic uh, effects. So we would want to see any assistance uh, be directly linked to this pandemic uh, and that it would have a, a, a timeline that would be appropriate in, in, in terms of making sure that it's, it, it exists while people are still suffering the outcomes or the, the impacts of, of, of this pandemic. So uh, that's our position that uh, relief should be targeted and, and last for as long as needed uh, based on the impacts of, of the pandemic. Uh, we, the Prime Minister and the government obviously are considering the Emergencies Act if needed. Uh, obviously the provinces have the jurisdiction to put different measures in place to enforce how people are behaving. We saw that in Nova Scotia today. Um, but there is still, there seems to be still some problems with Canadians actually following instructions. Would you be supportive of using that measure, which, um, which is essentially the new version of the War Measures Act, which has not been used since then? Mm. Uh, at this time, I haven't seen uh, 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 the, the evidence presented for the need uh, for that. Uh, obviously, this is a fluid situation and, and different levels of government are responding as best they, uh, as best they can. Uh, so far, uh, the existing tools that are there for municipalities, provincial levels of government, and, and of course the federal government uh, you know, are, are being used. And I think at this time, that's, uh, that's where we should be focusing on. Uh, you know, we, we, we're still kind of looking at the, the the full ramification of this pandemic or we're looking at we're, we're still trying to deal with people who are, are suffering uh, you know, catastrophic drops in personal income and, and revenue for small businesses we're of course learning more about how the virus spreads and what can be done in terms of testing so i think that's where the focus needs to be in the short term uh, and uh, of course you know w w our role our position going forward is to, to be one of a constructive opposition we're here to hold the government to account uh, ensure that they the tough questions are being asked uh, when they make decisions or, or decide not to do something. It's our job to, to, to raise that. We want to be a cooperative. Uh, we want to have a, a cooperative relationship uh, with the government at this point in time, but still advocating for uh, Canadians. That, that, that's a bit of a shift, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. The, the, the Conservative Party, the official opposition, seems to have dialed down uh, the partisan rhetoric over the past even 10 days to try and, as you say, be more constructive. Was that an intentional shift? Well, I, I think it's just a, an acknowledgement of, of the fact that uh, we're all we're all in this together. We're all fighting this pandemic together. We're all trying to be supportive of each other in our communities. It's a difficult time for everyone. Uh, people who are staying home for days on, uh, at a time, uh, people who haven't been able to go to work. Uh, we are, of course, recognizing that this is a, a, an unprecedented situation for this government. But at the same time, you know, it's our job to point out uh, some of the things that uh, haven't always been clear and consistent sure. to Canadians. Uh, just last week, just Justin Trudeau was saying that uh, travel bans don't work, that uh, uh, closing the border doesn't work, uh, restricting travel doesn't work. Uh, we pushed on that and a few days later uh, a change was made. Uh, we saw Public Safety Minister Bill Blair say that to people who are coming into Canadian airports would be subjected to screening. And then we saw people take to Twitter to show pictures to say that wasn't happening. Mm -hmm. So we raised those concerns. We we are still advocating for a better response to this pandemic, but we're doing so in a way that I, I hope uh, instills some confidence uh, in Canadians that uh, our institutions will work, our parliament will work, our, uh, and that we will all get through this together. And uh, and our opposition party is, is ready to, to, to help in any way we can, but also uh, to hold the government to account and, yes. and um, ensure that they're answering those types of questions. Um, finally, and Aaron O'Toole, one of the uh, people vying for uh, the job of leader of the Conservative Party today, called for the race to be suspended. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Are you prepared to stay on beyond uh, June if needed? Because it does seem it does seem pretty strange that the race is continuing given these extraordinary time that we're in. Mm -hmm. 
Well, uh, ultimately, that is a decision by the leadership committee of our national council. Uh, I will respect whatever decision they made. Uh, obviously, this. Uh, the, the situation has changed dramatically in, in the last week. It's hard to imagine that just a little over a week yes. ago, yes. Uh, everyone was still moving about, going about their daily routine uh, quite normally. So uh, I am sure that our national councillors and the members of that uh, committee are, are listening, listening to the concerns of members and Canadians as well, and, and each individual leadership candidate. And I know that they're taking this decision very, uh, very seriously, and I'm, um, I'll, I'll leave it to them to make a, a final decision. Okay, uh, you're in Regina right now. I'm not sure if you're going to make it back to Ottawa for the recalling of Parliament. Um, just how are you doing? How is your family doing? Not sure if they're with you. Um, how are you guys just coping personally? Yeah, well, thank you. And, and uh, uh, you know, we, we, we went home to Regina for the March break, and this is where we were when the music stopped, so to speak. Uh, so we've been uh, at home. Uh, five kids uh, kind of indoors mostly is a, is a little bit of a challenge, but I know it's a challenge for every family right now. So, uh, you know, in the first few days, the kids were just excited at the prospect of school not coming back. Uh, so we're doing our best to keep them off the off the uh, iPads and off the TV, getting them reading a bit more and uh, making up some indoor games. But uh, uh, I've been spending a lot of time on the phone with my colleagues, with my members of my team, a lot of conference calls, making sure that our members of parliament are up to date with the latest information from government, as well as my own constituents in Regina Capel. We've had a lot of people calling with loved ones uh, uh, stranded overseas or uh, finding in wanting information about how to apply for some of the new programs uh, that have been announced. So I've been very busy, a lot fewer face-to-face uh, -face meetings, a lot of work over the phone, and uh, we're taking the instructions of public health officers very seriously. Okay, glad to hear everybody's holding up, even with five kids running around the house. Uh, really important to get you on the airwaves, especially if uh, Parliament is not sitting. Important to hear opposition's voice uh, at this time as well. So thank you very much, Andrew. Sure, appreciate it. Thank you very much. All right, uh, let me go back to, uh, that was Andrew Shearer, of course, leader of the official opposition. He was in Regina. Let me get up, go back to David Cochran, uh, who was listening in on the Prime Minister's press conference to highlight a couple of the things that uh, I guess you thought were important there as we stand by and wait for ministers, David. Yeah, Rosie, I think there's sort of five newsy things there that I would point to. One is that Parliament is going to reopen on Tuesday at noon for a greatly diminished all-party, non-partisan session to pass the necessary legislation to, to do the aid package that the government has, responsive, has announced as an initial step to respond to this. WestJet has 30 flights ready to help with repatriation and those will start flying between Monday and Wednesday. So over the next three days, we're going to see WestJet uh, bring a serious number of Canadians home. We don't know precisely where those are going to go because those mm -hmm. ne negotiations are ongoing, but 30 planes from WestJet are on the way and other airlines such as Air Transat are ramping up, seeking permission to fly internationally, and Sunwing is trying to use its uh, empty seats on its planes to bring Canadians home. The Prime Minister is not ruling out more restrictions on movement. This has been a persistent question as social media has shown us pictures of people socializing in a way that is quite dangerous in an era of social distancing. Uh, but right now it seems like the approach is to let municipalities and provincial governments put yeah. those tougher restrictions in place. And, and that is certainly what is happening as province by province seems to escalate the restrictions and diminish the size of the gatherings that are allowed. And also an admission or an acknowledgement that the $82 billion age pa aid package is only a start and they're working on next steps. They know the economic contagion of this will be quite serious. To use a medical analogy, this initial aid package is kind of the emergency room medicine to stop the bleeding, the surgery and the rehabilitation needs to come. And, and we heard a really interesting idea, Rosie, from Sean Silkoff at the Globe and Mail in his question. He's been speaking with Goldie Hyder, for, uh, who's with the Business Council of Canada and a very sensible solutions-based kind of public policy voice who's suggesting that why doesn't the government send the money to companies to let companies send it to people because mm -hmm. we're seeing with the IT systems and this diminished workforce in the civil service right now, it's tough for the government to be the payroll department for the entire country. Mm -hmm. So maybe piggyback on the existing payroll departments so that you know it's going directly to workers who have been impacted by their jobs. So building on what we're seeing with the announcement on Friday of the new industrial policy of Canada of tilting manufacturing towards making the medical supplies that we need, now industry stepping up and offering to be the human resources departments for a federal government that is overwhelmed mm -hmm. to make sure that people get money in their banks as quickly as possible.
Yeah, it is an interest, interesting idea. Let me just uh, make one more comment on the repatriation flights because I know there's still lots of Canadians trying to get home. It did say, the Prime Minister did say some more in the days ahead. Mm -hmm. Sunwing, you mentioned, David, but they plan to bring 5,000 customers home today on about 30 flights, but they suspend operations tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So uh, things are starting to slow down in a lot of places as well. And, um, you know, uh, there's still opportunity for people to get home, but that opportunity will be diminished as commercial flights start to shut down as well. Um, let, let me just end again on the Emergencies Act, which I know we seem very hung up on as, as journalists. We ask about it every day. It, it, but essentially, um, it, essentially, it is the War Measures Act in a renewed form. It was created in the in the mid-80s, mid rather, and hasn't been used yet. But essentially, it, it is, just so people understand, David, if provinces are not doing enough or if provinces say they need help, like, I just wonder if there are, uh, you know, sort of backroom conversations about what the province are doing and what they're heading towards. Yeah, I, I mean, there are daily and consistent conversations with the provinces on what they need in their health departments, what they need, you know, for, for basic income support. But you're seeing more and more, Rosie. Nova Scotia says anyone who comes in, you have yeah. to self-isolate. Newfoundland and Labrador did that already. So did Prince Edward Island, the Northwest Territory, saying nobody can come in for any non-essential travel. So you're seeing restrictions at provincial borders that until the last couple of days have been reserved for the international borders. So I, I think they have been very cautious to not look like a, a government that is attacking the basic civil liberties of people yeah. in one of the world's best democracies. But I think the social media images over the weekend have just shaken the mood in a big way. As, as premiers and, and, and mayors are moving to these extreme measures, it, it becomes a question of how long Ottawa can really hold out. And, mm -hmm. and, and what you're seeing with, the, with lessons we've learned from places like Italy, there needs to be one clear, loud, consistent message. Right now, the Prime Minister has that platform, and it's on a much bigger level than Stephen McNeil has in Nova Scotia mm -hmm. or Dwight Ball has in Newfoundland and Labrador. And I, I think these are going to be questions that are going to continue to be asked. And, and if people keep you know, disobeying or defying these regulations to go to the beach or go to a playground yeah. and play street hockey in, in numbers greater than five or two, depending on what province you're in, um, the pressure is going to continue for the Prime Minister to look at this in a serious way. And as they said all along, they will not do this without consulting with other parties yeah. and consulting with the provinces. Um, the need for those consultations seems to be ramping up. Okay, David, thank you for that. I appreciate it. We're standing by for uh, cabinet ministers to speak to us again today, and David will be back for that. But let me show you a little bit of what Premier Stephen McNeil did have to say today, responding really to the fact that while some people are listening in Nova Scotia to the need for self-isolation and social distancing, others are really not. So the province took some extreme measures today. Here's what he had to say. Today, I need to focus on those who are not following public health advice. Over the weekend, I saw and heard of far too many incidents of people gathering, blatantly disregarding the social and physical distance rules of staying six feet or two meters apart. Hundreds gathering on our beaches and in our parks, large groups of people congregating, young people playing street hockey, cars parked everywhere, people disregarding law enforcement. We are dealing with a deadly virus and this behavior is unacceptable. And so today, effective immediately, I am declaring a provincial state of emergency. Minister Porter is here to explain what that means, and Minister Fury is here to explain how we will enforce it. We are also reducing the size of gatherings effective immediately. People cannot gather in groups of more than five. You can still go outside, but you walk to exercise not to socialize. Stay in your neighborhood, walk around the block or down the street. Our provincial parks are closed. If you go there, you are trespassing and your vehicles will be towed. You can get groceries, you can go to the pharmacy, but do not do it in packs. Identify a single family member who can do those errands. And if you are an individual helping neighbors, please continue to do so. Again, that is the Premier of Nova Scotia announcing some ramped up measures in that province as we are starting to see bit by bit across the country. The CBC's Shana Luck is in Halifax now. Uh, Shana, the, the, this, you know, the Premier almost seemed to be, you know, a little, I don't know if angry is the right word, but very frustrated that people were not following public health advice. 
Well, that's right, Rosie. Uh, certainly, the Premier has told us a couple of times earlier in the week that he didn't think a state of emergency was required. That all changed this morning. Uh, and the Premier told us, as you heard in that clip, that this was really due to what he'd seen over the weekend. This is a very sunny spring weekend. Uh, yesterday, certainly on Saturday, we saw many people posting on social media how uh, crowded our beaches were, how crowded our parks were. We've seen uh, videos on social media of uh, hundreds of cars parked in the parking lots of those recreational places. And that is why the Premier told us today that he had decided to move to the state of emergency, limiting uh, the number of people who can gather together to five, no more than five. And the province is bringing in as well uh, fines and the ability for law enforcement to potentially arrest people if they're found to be uh, in violation of self-isolation self or social distancing. Um, we are told that police will have the ability to fine people $1,000 a day for an individual and that can accumulate for multiple days. Businesses will face even more, $7,500. Okay, Shana Luck, thanks for giving us a perspective of what's happening in Nova Scotia. Life is changing dramatically out there and across the country. Appreciate it very much. Just to leave you with uh, the latest that we have from the Prime Minister before uh, we bring you the Cabinet Minister's uh, press conference on CBC News Network. The Prime Minister saying the House of Commons will be recalled on Tuesday at noon to pass some extraordinary measures to help Canadians stay afloat. He also had a nice message for kids saying, hang in there, you'll have more to say to them too. Time to say goodbye to those of you watching on CBC Television, except in Manitoba. You'll be with us for the next half hour.